Hearing is reconvened. I hope you had a chance in the brief interval to address the subject at hand. Rhode Island is neither a road nor an island. Welcome back and forgive us for the length of voting on the floor of House of Representatives, but it's always a little unpredictable. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, welcome back. Uh, we were discussing 3161 uh, term employees, and I wonder, Ms. Farrell, if you might comment from the GAO's perspective on the deployment of term employees and the issue, I think Mr. Hallmark had indicated that they had health care benefits in the event of PTSD showing up, for example, years later. I thought the words you used were in perpetuity. Is that correct? That's our understanding as well, that what's been conveyed is correct about those temporary employees. Combat related or environment yeah. related, obviously they don't have health care benefits in perpetuity. Correct. Could you expand? Uh, our understanding is that they would be entitled to the, let's take DOD's uh, memo regarding uh, non-DOD uh, employees who have compelling reasons for care would be eligible for that at military treatment facilities. So they would be fall into that temporary, whether they're served for less than 180 days or more than 180 days, or despite the classification, they would be eligible for certain care. Yeah, eligible, but, again, but, but let me turn to Ms. Fitzgerald on, uh, as a follow-up to your response. It was my understanding that that's still up to DOD, whether somebody who's not a DOD employee would actually have the benefits of a DOD facility, and that's being determined on a case-by-case -case basis at the moment. Is that correct? That's correct. So in the case, I think, where, where we are, for those who are under the 3161 authority who are not DOD employees, and even those who are DOD employees, fall under the workers' compensation program. And so for life, they have access to medical care, free of charge, if you will, if it's been determined to be covered by this, at their own private medical care facilities. If they're DOD 3161s, there's that added benefit that they do, can, and they can since they were former federal and former DOD employees have access to our military treatment facilities. Mm -hmm. So let me get this straight. If I'm a Department of Agriculture employee, and I am, I'm sorry, if, do, if the Department of Agriculture hires me as a 3161 term limited employee, I'm limited for a five-year term, is that correct? Okay, I'm deployed to Afghanistan to help in the poppy eradication program and crop substitution program. And uh, I'm unwittingly witness to and involved in hostile fire, uh, some kind of traumatic incident. Uh, I'm not hurt. Uh, I get on with my business. As a matter of fact, I resume my duties in Afghanistan and when my term is up, I feel fine. I come home. Ten years later, out of the clear blue, uh, I'm shopping at the mall, and all of a sudden, I hear a loud noise, and my, I'm back in Afghanistan, and all of a sudden, I'm not the person my wife thinks I am, and neither am I. And clearly, I need some help. Am I eligible still for federal medical mm -hmm. care, and where do I go as a non as a, as a non-former DOD employee who was hired by DOA, not DOD. Anybody? Well, if I can interrupt. Three years. Uh, you have, it's, you're not interrupting, you're answering. <laughs> well, you, you, do you want to take the answer? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, the, the individual uh, in the example you give would have the opportunity to file a claim under FECA uh, if they learn of the connection between this condition that has evolved 10 years later and their employment, uh, and they filed a claim within, uh, I believe it's three years of the time they knew or should have known of that connection. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, space for that person to be able to come forward and file a claim. It would then be adjudicated by OWCP to determine whether there was, in fact, a causal relationship between that medical condition and the events that occurred in Afghanistan. And if there was, then uh, that, as, as Ms. Fitzgerald indicated, then the benefits for that condition would be paid 
100 percent by the Department of Labor. Uh, the issue that would arise and that, that probably is of concern to the folks at the table is making sure that people know that they have that uh, capability because if they're a temporary employee and they've gone off to work somewhere entirely different, they're no longer within the uh, uh, federal uh, um, uh, civilian uh, structure, uh, there would be a need to make sure that people, as they are exiting out of that position, have knowledge about what they're eligible for in the future. M Mr. Hallmark, though, if I could stick with the example I had and your response to it, under that example we're both talking about, but I'd be sent, you, you may or may not approve the claim I submit, but it would be a claim to a private provider. It would be a claim to the federal government and the individual's medical treatment would be uh, through a physician of their, of their choice. Yeah, but, but time But out. it would not be uh, my a position, military. But my position is not an expert in post-traumatic stress syndrome. That expertise, by and large, resides in the military side of medicine in this country, not the civilian side of medicine. Most hospitals in America don't have in-depth experience with combat-related PTSD. So why would you limit me to uh, a, my private physician or a series of private physicians who have no expertise in my problem, which was acquired because of my experience in a military combat environment well, as a civilian employee nonetheless? The Labor Department doesn't limit the individual's ability. We simply say we will pay for the physician that you choose. Um, but in, what, okay, I choose to get the best expertise in the world, which happens to be in military health care facilities. Then, sir, this policy. You need to speak, Ms. Fitzgerald, then sorry. thank you. Then the policy that Ms. Farrell talked about would apply. Then the individual would have to come to DOD and request a special permission to use the military treatment facility for their continued care. But there is no policy going forward that would guarantee 10 or 15 years hence, and we still have Vietnam veterans 30 years later suffering PTSD. So right now, the policy is on a case-by-case -case basis, and frankly, it's at your sufferance. It's not my right. right. It's at your sufferance. That's correct. You're being generous under those rules and saying yes to most cases who apply, but there's no guarantee 20 or 30 years hence you'll continue that policy. That's correct. Whereas if I were in the military and had the same symptoms at the same time, in fact, everything I described applied to me wearing a uniform or having one, then by entitlement, I would have access to military care and the expertise of post-traumatic stress syndrome intervention. That's true, but the department has always, as long as we can trace this back, has always provided for the exception for individuals to come into the military treatment facility if they needed care. And then there are a couple of things that are happening that might be helpful too. They're not perhaps adequate substitutes, but we are setting up the Centers for Traumatic Brain Injury, and one of those centers is is a repository of where physicians and employees can go to get the latest information on care and so on. So that may be helpful as a resource center. Um, and certainly the department has and continues to make available its knowledge and transports its knowledge across the civilian community in these cases. And then uh, for now, that's what the policy is, that they would come to the Department of Defense and seek special permission to come into a military treatment facility. I've not been aware of any that we've denied. Ambassador Browning, we've talked about a lot of subjects. Anything you wanted to comment on in terms of the range of questions, I, I obey it with an interruption. I don't think your microphone's on. Thank I you. I must um, admit that I've only been on the job less than two months, so I'm not uh, an expert by any means in the full scope of what we as a department do. Uh, I have, in, in preparations for this uh, testimony, have been educating myself on it, and I am learning the difficulties uh, that um, are out there in tracking former employees. Uh, when a, an employee that the State Department retires, uh, we give them a copy of their medical records, if they ask for it, 
uh, they sign the papers, they go away, and we don't hear from them again. We don't track them, we don't keep in touch with them, and they have no benefits uh, accrued to them that we would have to offer them for their continued service. Uh, it's an excellent point that the, the expertise in dealing with PTSD is uh, centered around veterans hospitals in Washington, D.C. Um, and quite frankly, we haven't, the number of cases we've seen are so small, uh, I think it's a total of six, uh, for the universe of our population, uh, that we right now haven't set up a program to, uh, to address it beyond our, our um, tracking the employees. In terms of what the department is doing to track our 3161s have left us, we've, had, we've noted that this has been a problem. Those who leave us after short periods of service, how do we stay connected with them? And we do feel the obligation to do that, take that very seriously. When we stood up our new civilian readiness unit, we have built in the capability there to track those folks. So now all these post-deployment physicals and so on, we have a place to track those who take them and these assessments. So we know who they are, and then we are taking on an outreach effort so that we stay in touch with them through their period of departure, even if we do it annually through a little note that says, hi, we're still worried about you and care about you. Are there anything, you know, services that you need? Please feel free to contact us to be very deliberate about it. But we had to install, a, you know, a separate organizational capability to do that. It, it still remains a challenge once they leave you. Yeah. Since I got you, Ms. Fitzgerald, let me ask you um, a question. Um, and I, I think in some ways it does come back, Mr. Mikowitz, to, frankly, OPM's abrogation of leadership in not chairing the interagency uh, group. But uh, we have found some federal agencies were unaware of the fact that their employees could avail themselves of DOD services when they come back with uh, service-related medical problems including injuries, uh, which is a little stunning uh, given the fact that they serve too and why wouldn't they have available to them the same services as anybody else. So what proactively is DOD doing or planning to do to make sure that all federal agencies are aware of the availability on an equal basis? We did three things. When the report first came out about making the communication more widespread and known among our, and the benefit more known among our communities, we sent out um, a communication to our federal agencies and we did a briefing. We brought our federal agencies in and we provided a briefing to them of the benefits that are available. That was the first thing we did. The second thing we did is we institutionalized that communication effort and put it on our website so that they could have access to it. And the third thing that we're doing is we've developed or are developing, ready to launch it by the end of the month, uh, or the end of October, I'm sorry. It's a, a short uh, PowerPoint presentation that takes someone through the process and um, it sort of rep in a way that sort of speaks to them in more easily understand terms than perhaps a policy would. So that this PowerPoint presentation could be used in any forum where our federal agencies are orientating, they're giving a pre-deployment orientation to their folks. And we think the combination of those three efforts may be helpful in ensuring that this knowledge is institutionalized in all of our, our federal agencies. And we'll be ready to roll out that training module, as I said, sometime in October. I'm sure that would be helpful because it, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that the uh, two individuals to your left uh, actually represent agencies that were not aware of that fact. State Department and Department of Agriculture were not aware of the fact that apparently, based on our information, that DOD offered the service and it was available to their employees when they came back. So, I mean, uh, we have work to do. Ms. Farrell, from GAO's point of view, I think, well, I ask you, is this not a weakness in the system, lack of communication, lack of uniformity, different policies, different benefits, uh, sort of a hodgepodge, and, and, and even problems tracking how many of our employees, or as the ambassador indicated, former employees, have in fact served and may or may not over some period of time need to be tracked, even if they don't need it today, they may in the future need medical help and services that is a future claim on the federal government. Your comment. Uh, I think you've hit upon several of the issues that our report brings to, to light, especially that of identification and tracking. Uh, you've probably noticed in our report, we'll note, according to DOD and State Department officials, 
Over 10,000 employees have been deployed since uh, 2001, and DOD has a more current number now, stating somewhere in the neighborhood of 41,000. Uh, this has uh, been a challenge that DOD has been working on since 1995, uh, and they've made some progress in trying to get a handle on it, but we still need to know about the other agencies. And you're exactly right. You need to identify them, track their movements. Issues can develop years after the deployment, and in order to have that communication, you have to be able to identify them and know where they are. Thank you. And, and Mr. Mikowitz, I think I hope that's a message to brought back to OPM leadership because if OPM isn't going to take the lead in trying to create some sense of equity and uniformity across the board for our civilian workforce serving in you know, dangerous environments, who is? Uh, it can't be DOD. They've got their hands full with their own, their own challenges. I just think it's got to be somebody like OPM, and, and that's why I would hope that with the new administration, new leadership, the issue of chairing that interagency group would be revisited and swiftly. I will certainly take this information back to Director I thank Barry. you. Thank you. I, and because we of time and we have one more panel, I have one more question, and that has to do, Mr. Hallmark, uh, among the GAO findings uh, was one that's pretty stunning. Approximately 80 percent of deployed civilians who filed a claim with the Office of Workman's Compensation reported experiencing problems. By the way, much higher satisfaction among those filing claims with DOD. N nowhere near 80 percent. Uh, what kinds of changes do you think are going to be necessary to try to bring that number down to something more satisfactory? I am not aware of the 80 percent uh, satisfaction finding, but uh, we are working, as I said in my uh, comments, uh, every day to try to improve the uh, performance. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it's, uh, FICA process is a joint interactive process that involves OWCP at labor and the employing agency, and that's true wherever the, the injury occurs. Uh, and it's just something that we need to work together um, increasingly well uh, to make uh, the outcomes appropriate. As well, I said, uh, one of the things that we've done uh, is, is set up uh, processes whereby we communicate out of our Cleveland office with the employing agencies uh, where a, a claim is, has reached the point where we don't believe we can accept it so that we give the agency a chance to help us come to uh, the, the right outcome. Uh, I think that's working. Uh, that may result in some cases the uh, case taking a little longer than it would uh, in the normal course, but we think that's the right outcome in that circumstance to make sure that we get to the right answer. Um, Ms. Farrell, can you confirm for me, Mr. Hallmark indicated he was not aware of that 80 percent. That is a finding of the GAO study, is it not? Yes, we looked at the, you're referring to the 125 of the 188 claims that took significantly longer than the uh, goal of 45 days, it took in some cases 20 percent longer than that. So it, again, it dates back to the person following the claim not having a clear understanding of what documentation is required so that then when they do submit it, it's facilitated. And those particular claims that we broke down also were related to TBIs, which uh, if someone has a TBI, it's very difficult, I would think, for do, them to put the package Do you know together. what the comparable statistic would be for DOD? No, I do not. But not 80 percent? Not 80 percent. Ms. Fitzgerald? I don't know what the satisfaction rate is with the services at DOL. I can tell you that we've had a, by our statistics, in 2008, there was a, uh, about a 15 percent increase in the swiftness in which the, the, the documentation was processed and received at DOL. And part of that goes to what Mr. Hallmark talked about. Some things have changed since the day the, uh, the report was done by the GO to fix the problems that were found at that time. Obtaining the appropriate evidentiary documentation is very difficult in a war zone. And early on, we learned that. These folks would, would come back, and the physicians who even attended to them in the beginning were no even longer a part of the federal government. And so it was hard to go back and try and accumulate the documentation that was needed. Mm -hmm. So today, there are systems in place that try and help gather that documentation. And with the intervention of the federal agencies, 
by allowing a little time for us to intervene before they deny a claim, allowing us to get in and helping to assemble that documentation, we've been able to help improve the processing and I think the outcomes for the individuals. Thank you. And, and, and let me just say um, to all of you and Mr. Hallmark in particular, um, you know, this is the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, we, we are at war. We're running two wars right now. And irrespective of how one may feel about that, the men and women who serve, whether they are in uniform or they're civilian federal employees, are brave men and women who have call, answered the call of their country. In theory, uh, you could have two people in a vehicle uh, who are hit by an RPG or, or they hit an IED, one's in uniform and one's a civilian employee of federal agency X. Both of them lose their left arm. Both of them are treated in field combat um, uh, medical facilities uh, with expert care. But one of them comes home to a medical, uh, a military medical system, and the other does not necessarily. And over time, we have two different approaches to two different individuals who did the same work, or I'm sorry, served the same purpose, and were involved in the same accident with the same injuries. And there are issues of equity that flow from that and fairness, and we want to make sure that at the very least there isn't a delay and that if we need to facilitate their, their having the evidentiary documentation they need, then let's help them. Uh, but 80 percent doesn't cut the mustard. Final point, Ms. Fitzgerald, we get complaints from a lot of civilians who do have access to military medical care in these circumstances who, because of a bureaucratic snafu, however, cannot get the necessary uh, credentialing to, in fact, have access to the base. Now, when I was chairman of Fairfax County, uh, I had my own uh, uh, stickers on my car mm -hmm. by virtue of that capacity for Fort Belvoir, and I wasn't seeking medical care daily or weekly. These brave men and women need we need to facilitate their access to the base without bureaucratic hassle. And security is one thing. These people have been through hell and back. We need to help them. So I'm, I'm going to count on you to please take that back to DOD. We, we don't want to be hearing about those kinds of problems. They've got enough to manage without that. Absolutely. I think you'll be happy to hear that we are going to be modifying the credentialing card that we give so that the back of it gives them swipe access to the bases and so on. So we, we're hopefully we fix that problem. I thank you all so much. Thank you for your forbearance and the schedule of the House of Representatives, and thanks for serving your country. We, we may be submitting some additional questions for the record and would appreciate your getting back to us. Thank you all very much. Our second panel. And I'm going to read this while you all are shuffling seats. We have two members in our second panel, Dr. Jonathan Shea, who's a clinical psychiatrist, recently retired from the Department of Veterans Affairs Outpatient Clinic in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, my hometown, where he garnered eminent expertise in the treatment of combat trauma suffered by Vietnam veterans. From 2004 to 2005, he served as chair of ethics, leadership, and personnel policy in the office of the U.S. Army Deputy Chief of Staff of Personnel. Dr. Shea is also the renowned author of Achilles in Vietnam, Combat Trauma and the Undoing of Character, and has, re re has written more recently a book, Odysseus in America, Combat Trauma and the Trials of Homecoming. And he promotes the adoption of policies to minimize future psychological trauma. Um, also serving on this panel is uh, Ms. Susan Johnson. Ms. Johnson is the current president of the American Foreign Service Association and has served in Iraq as senior advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the office of the High Representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina as deputy high representative and supervisor of Birko District. Did I pronounce that right, Susan? Bircho. Uh, and she recently served as senior coordinator in the front office of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Welcome both and if you would rise to be sworn in. If you would raise your right hands. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I thank you. Let the record show both witnesses uh, indicated in the affirmative. Uh, we have your uh, prepared testimony, and I would ask that you summarize uh, in the space of five minutes uh, the basis of that testimony, Dr. Shea. Welcome.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see that the ranking member is no longer here, so I can. Um, I am, as you so kindly pointed out, someone who learned his chops from combat veterans as a psychiatrist in the VA. The veterans have been wonderful teachers. Uh, you were kind enough to mention my two books, and as much of an obsessed author as I am, I don't have to mention them again. They, the veterans have made me their missionary to the military forces on prevention of psychological and moral injury in military service. And it's been an amazing trip for me. In the course of it, and you mentioned that I've worked for General Jim Jones, now the President's National Security Advisor, for the Army G1, Lieutenant General Hagenbeck, and uh, most recently, uh, an interesting gig at the Army War College. I'm not a universal expert. I believe that what I've learned about soldiers and veterans probably has applicability to other populations, other folks who are going into harm's way. I, my riff to the um, military people as to how to protect their people <clears throat> is threefold. To provide for stable face-to-face -face community when going into danger. Train them together, send them into danger together, and bring them home together. It's not rocket science. The second is expert, ethical, and properly supported leadership. The third is prolonged cumulative training for what they actually have to do and face. So my mantra is over and over, cohesion, leadership, training. Cohesion, leadership, training as the keys to preventing psychological and moral injury. Now, this is an easy sell to military folks because they're also combat strength multipliers. I do not know the world of the diplomat uh, or the agricultural specialist or the person from the FBI uh, assigned to some investigative duties in Iraq. Uh, people would have to make these translations for themselves. And in my written testimony, I tried to use my imagination as to how non-DOD agencies might hear my words to the military for their own purposes. Uh, I apologize for any way these recommendations might be off base. It's, it comes out of my ignorance. I'm not a universal expert. But I do feel quite confident that some of the things that I say are of merit, and that is to always, as far as possible, to be thinking in terms of teams that you're not deploying people to a war zone one by one by one by one, but as uh, work communities. Uh, in the matter of leadership and policy, or leadership policy, if you wish, I want to emphasize something that is probably counterintuitive and that is that there needs to be policy on sleep. Uh, sleep crops up again and again as a cause of psychological injury and something that keeps it going once it's established. Finally, on training, I would hope that our federal agencies are making use of uh, hostile environment training. I know that journalists uh, sometimes get it. The BBC trains all their war, war correspondents. They give them hostile environment training. And that the teams, to the extent that they 
are deployed as teams must cross train so they know each other's jobs. That's a very positive thing. Now, this is really good for the agencies to do this, not out of pure humanitarian impulse or a sense of responsibility, but it's good for you because terrible things happen when your employees acquire bad psychological injuries. And the worst of these are operational paralysis, um, desertion, uh, people check out psychologically or physically, and unfortunately there is always the potential for recruitment to extremist causes, people who carry these injuries. And I'm not running the riff that somehow it's the political right that has a unique attraction. Uh, the sorry history of Weimar Germany indicates that both the political right and the political left and the anarchists and the criminals uh, are equally capable of recruiting people vulnerable to it because of their psychological injuries. Thank you, Dr. Shea, and we'll come back, uh, obviously, to that, uh, that thesis uh, in, in questioning. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of AFSA and the employees of the member agencies, um, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before this committee on the subject of benefits for federal employees deployed abroad. AFSA warmly welcomes the renewed bipartisan commitment to investing in our civilian diplomatic and development services. Key to that investment is ensuring that all the men and women who are patriotically serving our country overseas, particularly in combat zones, whether military or civilian, are being taken care of and receiving well-earned benefits, making the focus of this hearing both urgent and welcome. So thank you again. The GAO report on human capital highlights the major compensation equity issue facing members of the Foreign Service. The loss of locality pay when junior and mid-level members of our services are deployed abroad. This overseas pay gap represents a major inequity within our agencies. Junior and mid-level Foreign Service members now take a pay cut to serve at 183 of 267 overseas posts, that's 68% of them, which often effectively zeroes out the hardship and danger pay allowances for everyone except those at the senior levels. This problem faces Foreign Service personnel across the U.S. government, not just at state, but also at USAID, the Foreign Commercial Service, the Foreign Agricultural Service, and the International Broadcasting Bureau. I'm pleased to report that the first steps to resolve this issue through a phased approach over three years have been taken, but further authorization language is needed to finish the job by 2011. Completely closing this gap and ending a longstanding and divisive inequity remains a top AFSA priority. I'd like to thank uh, Secretary Clinton and Undersecretary for Management Pat Kennedy for their dedication and efforts on this issue and for working closely with AFSA to find a solution. And of course, we would like to thank the many members of Congress that have helped correct this unintended inequ inequity. Turning to the other recommendations of the GAO report. Overall, AFSA supports the recommendations that GAO made to the State Department in this report. We also agree with State's response and its action plan to implement these recommendations, particularly the mandatory medical screenings upon completion of assignment in a combat zone. Members of the Foreign Service should not have to worry about being able to receive the medical care they need while deployed abroad, particularly in war zones. AFSA agrees with the GAO that this policy needs clarification and encourages the Department of Defense and the State Department to coordinate and communicate the policy more clearly to employees deployed abroad. AFSA applauds State Department's new Deployment Stress Management Program, DSMP, a community-based program to support psychological health of members of our Foreign Service assigned to high-stress, high-threat, unaccompanied tours. 
We look forward to working with the State Department to ensure that DSMP continues to meet the needs of the Foreign Service. One area that the GAO report does not address and that we would encourage this committee and the GAO to review is support for dependents of Foreign Service members and other civilian employees who are deployed abroad at unaccompanied posts. We would like to see the services provided to family left at home brought more closely in line with those provided by the Department of Defense to military dependents in similar situations through the Military One Source Program. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your support. We appreciate your leadership in convening this hearing and AFSA hopes to continue to be a resource to you and to this subcommittee in representing the views of the Foreign Service. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. And thank you both again for your testimony and your forbearance as well with the vicissitudes of House voting uh, patterns. Uh, we, we had, we had, our earlier information, by the way, was we weren't going to have any votes until about 4 o'clock, and of course, so much for that. We voted at a little after 2.30. Um, let me ask you, Dr. Shea, first, and Ms. Johnson, your comments would be welcome. Uh, to what extent do federal civilian employees have the same kinds of risks when they're deployed in hostile environments as the military for psychological injury? Um, clearly, there are certain risks that they don't face. Uh, every soldier faces the risk that he's going to fire his weapon at someone that he then realizes he shouldn't have and carries that on his soul for the rest of his life. And that's terrible. And civilian employees, unless they're armed, um, are, don't face that. But in terms of the general exposure, both to uh, personal threat, but also, so to speak, the moral exposure to witnessing terrible things happening to other people. Uh, whether it's them getting blown up or uh, A is brutalizing B and nobody's doing anything about it, and the awful things that people witness in war zones can sear people. Well, in other words, putting aside the first example you gave, because presumably somebody for a given department, civilian employee is probably not armed uh, or may not be authorized to be armed, but, but the second example you give, we could witness the same horror Absolutely. and have virtually the same impact on us emotionally. And that's right. Ms. Johnson, your take on that? No, I, I would agree with the comments that Dr. Shea has made. Uh, naturally, in some, in some respects, the risks differ. But since World War II, um, 160 uh, Foreign Service members have been killed in the line of duty. Uh, the v vast majority of those as a result of terrorist attack, either blowing up of embassies, snipers, uh, blowing up of cars, or other attacks of the sort. Um, in addition, certainly in both Iraq and Afghanistan, um, civilian members who are serving in PRTs and who are serving all over the country face many, if not all, of the same risks that their military counterparts do, and certainly witness um, much of the violence and uh, you know, danger experienced by the military. If I may add just that uh, military officers uh, face strain, m moral strain and moral injury based on things that they know were done by other people on the basis of their decisions or the information that they gave to others. And I would not be surprised if there are analogous injuries in the foreign service world where people know they made decisions or gave information that led to a horrific outcome, unintended outcome, but they carry that with them. 
don't know to what extent this exactly relates to that. Perhaps Dr. Shea would know better. But um, certainly we saw, and I served in Iraq um, from July through December of 2003, and several of the Iraqis in the Ford ministry that I worked with were assassinated, targeted and assassinated directly as a result of visibly working and cooperating with us. And so that's something that you do carry, that here's someone that you have worked closely with and who has worked with the United States who's then assassinated as a result of that. Sure. You, you could feel terribly guilty by putting, unwittingly putting yeah. someone at terrible exactly. risk. Exactly. Yeah. Th those, are, those are things that you have to try to deal right. with. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, in light of that, uh, the comparability of trauma exposure, uh, should, uh, when folks come home in the civilian workforce, should they have uh, available to them Veterans Affairs medical care? Should, should the VA be open to previously deployed federal civilian employees? It appears to me that the, the VA or the vet centers, uh, or as I've heard about for the first time today, I was unaware of this, or the military treatment facilities, uh, this is an obvious uh, opportunity for Congress, should it wish to, um, by legislation, to create that eligibility. Um, that uh, is an, sort of an obvious avenue for the Congress. Ms. Johnson, any opinion on that matter? Well, I think uh, that you know, having options generally you know, increases the ability to handle whatever issues that you're facing. So I think it's good to the extent that we're facing a very complex, difficult problem and to a certain degree some uncharted territory. Um, so my instincts tell me that in those cases, uh, options, having options are better than not having them. And as I mentioned in another option for Congress, uh, some entity like the GAO could do a study of what kind of expertise is out there outside of the normal uh, places to find it, the VA, the vet centers, the military uh, medicine establishment, and where these people are. I'm not suggesting that they create a directory, but I think it's important, given the need that these data be gathered and analyzed so that we know what the resources are. You both heard the previous discussion with the, your previous panel members, and uh, I, I wonder what your take is. I mean, I, uh, some of the requisite, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, resident expertise in the world on, for example, brain injuries, is at Bethesda. That's right. Uh, some of the resident expertise in the world on uh, fitting of prosthetic devices, dealing with amputations and rehabilitation related to that, including the emotional management mm -hmm. of, of both, is at Walter Reed. Uh, Brook Army Medical Center. Uh, that's right, or the, or the Army Medical Center, exactly. So someone comes back from the State Department similarly injured with similar needs, he or she is, in theory, shepherded to civilian side of medicine where comparable expertise does simply not exist. And as, we, as you heard, the State Department and the Department of Agriculture who were at this table weren't aware, actually were not aware of the fact that DOD had opened its doors mm. in these circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis mm at their sufferance, uh, my words, not theirs. Uh, and they've been good about it, but, but if you don't know about it, you're not going to get the high quality care available to your military counterpart who comes back a wounded warrior and veteran. I wonder what your observations would be about that situation. Well, it's, it's, something that one becomes very familiar with when dealing with combat veterans, and that is that it is 
a matter of luck and can be very capricious as to whether the injured veteran and the resources get together smoothly and quickly and effectively or they pass each other like ships in the night or they collide in some terribly messy uh, crash and everybody gets hurt. Um, so finding ways that this wonderful phrase, seamless transition, that's a great line of public prayer. The hard part is making it actually happen and happen reliably. Ms. Johnson. I think it's uh, excellent that the committee is, you know, focusing on some of these sort of, I would say over the horizon, but actually they're, they're closer than that now. Um, we are increasingly seeing civilians deployed in, in what we're calling, I guess, zones of armed conflict. It's inevitable, sadly, that more of them are going to be suffering various types of injuries, whether physical or psychological, moral, emotional. Um, I think we need to be looking at what is the um, sensible and effective way to provide, you know, fair and equivalent treatment. Um, I don't know if it's the same. Um, as Dr. Shea said, maybe this would be a very suitable topic for a, st uh, you know, a, a study to take a look at it and see what's the best solution. But the civilian side needs to be looking at what are we going to do to support our civilians who are serving um, in zones of armed conflict along with their military counterparts. You all, AFSA, published its third annual poll about a year ago, a little, well, a year and a half ago now. Uh, did you pick up anything in that poll in terms of attitudes of your members uh, with respect to compensation and benefits while deployed in either Iraq or Afghanistan on the quality of, of each? Well, I, if I could quickly summarize sort of the, the main results of that poll, and I hope that we'll have a chance to do a follow-up one in not too far future. Um, certainly the pay disparity and the locality pay and the canceling out of hardship and danger pay was a top priority. Um, Iraq and Afghanistan staffing concerns of a broad variety uh, came a close second. Um, other things relate more to internal State Department procedures, uh, unfair assignment and promotion um, policies. Uh, and, and one thing that maybe relates to this is a um, perception that the um, workplace in the Foreign Service is one of diminishing family friendliness and, be, and becoming more and more difficult to you know, sustain or maintain family units and putting more and more stress on them, not just the uh, members, the direct employees, but their dependents and their family. Uh, I don't believe that it uh, you know, addressed directly the question that you asked, but that could be something we could look at in the future. Yeah, uh, on the family friendly thing, I earlier this year was on a trip uh, to a country I won't name, whose ambassador, US ambassador, was married to another U.S. ambassador who was in a very different country in a very different part of the world. And uh, it made you wonder, I'm sure that's a good thing. I'm glad <laughs> we're tapping into their talent, but it's got to be a strain on their marriage and their family. Um, okay, Dr. Shea, I've got to give you this opportunity. You've written two wonderful books. And, <laughs> and if you were to write a third from Achilles to Odysseus, <laughs> how would you compare the experiences you document in, on Vietnam with what were, I mean, what are the differences and similarities with the experience we're now uh, experiencing in, in Iraq and Afghanistan compared to Vietnam? Uh, well, um, don't write I, the third book yeah, here. They, they, but give uh, us sort of a preview. I, I have a third book that is really a for military professionals and policymakers called Trust Within Fighting Forces that's been hanging around my neck like an albatross and I'm trying to get it off its bottom. Um, but um, uh, I'm the guy that said war is war is war is war and it hasn't changed in 3,000 years as far as what matters in the heart of the soldier and that the obstacles to returning to civilian life, many of those haven't changed in 3,000 years. As, as long as 
humans pursue this hideous practice of war, it's going to hurt people physically and psychologically. And we have to protect them as best we can and heal them as best we can when they do get hurt. Any, anything in particular strike you as uh, either absolutely similar to or absolutely different from the, the previous experience in Vietnam when you're looking the, at... The climate in Vietnam is very different than the climate in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, or at least most parts of it. I think there are some quite tropical parts of Iraq, but um, other, I, I honestly, not much strikes me. There, I don't know of anybody who, who talked about the dust storms in Vietnam. Um, I, I guess I was getting at not so much the difference in climate and geography as the, the, the uh, similarities or differences in uh, trauma or injuries suffered by well, our... It, it, insurgencies are wicked hard on the combatants in that the enemy is intentionally blurring the distinction between uh, armed combatant and quote-unquote legitimate targets, necessary targets, and protected persons, to use the terminology of the law of land warfare. Uh, I think it's clear in this conflict, as it was in Vietnam, that the distinction between a legitimate target and a protected person means everything for the future mental health and uh, moral integrity of the person who's been in war. And those people who glibly say, oh, there are no rules in war, don't understand the heart of the soldier. They don't want to know themselves to be murderers. And um, I, I know for a fact that this is the point of view of our military leadership today. I just a couple weeks ago spoke to the commander's conference at the 101st Airborne, and they made it very clear that the moral dimension of what they do is critically important to them, and I, for one, stand up and cheer because it's what will protect their mind and spirit. I, 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 if I can just make one comment about what we've heard uh, in the previous panel, I got a clarification on the fly about this 41,000 civilians number. And I'm told that that is 41,000 Department of Defense civilians. So this number does not include any other federal employees, number one. And number two, it totally leaves out federal uh, contractors who are working either directly under federal contracts or are working for subcontractors, <laughs> the fleas have littler fleas and so right. forth. And, and that number could be in the hundreds of thousands. So the, the, the population duration. that we're talking about is not 41,000. It's much larger. Very good point. Because we know that there are AID folks uh, and contractors associated with that. We know that there are Department of Agriculture people, Department of Labor people, so forth and so on. So. Uh, there are lots more than just the 41,000 to serve with DOD. Um, I want to thank you both so much for sharing today and uh, your thoughts. If you have additional material you want to submit to the record, we'd be delighted to have it. Uh, and um, I want to thank you again for your forbearance with our schedule today. It was very helpful to this committee and to this subcommittee. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.
he always was the, asked the janitor, janitor if he could vacuum in the classrooms, and he would let him. He vacuumed the principal's office every now and then. And, and he also vacuumed the school bus uh, one, right. one time. They don't give extra credit for that, Kyle. Halloween, when I was two years old, I dressed up as a dirt devil vacuum cleaner made out of a huge box that basically my dad just would set over me. But I thought I was a cool witch, but, you know, we went trick-or-treating together and, oh, look, it's a vacuum. Nobody cared about me. He got all the attention for being a vacuum. That sucks, sis. After collecting vacuums for so many years, it's no surprise that Kyle has become an unofficial expert in vacuum repair. That's right, multi-million dollar vacuum companies recruit this 14-year-old boy to test out new models. Before they release the final product, they want my insight, what's wrong with it, what needs to be improved. I look for what the consumer wants. Yep, when it comes to vax, Kyle's expertise and collection is a clean sweep. When we return, a man so crazy for vintage cars, he built a 1950s town just to house his. This is my little town and something that I wanted to do my whole life. And meet the most shoe-tastic shoe addict in the country. When my cousin first saw my shoe collection, she said, boy, you don't do anything half do you? When Extreme Collections continues. Someday, cars will be engineered using nanotechnology to convert plants into components. The first ever HS Hybrid, only from Lexus. Okay, you're all set. There's lots of things that make Pearl Vision different, like no surprise costs at our registers. And our offers are different too. Right now, it's buy one complete pair of eyeglasses and get a second pair free for you or anyone in your family. Visit pearlvision.com. Best Western gives you more times four. Stay any two, three, or four nights between September 13th and November 22nd, and you can earn double, triple, or even quadruple points when you pay with your MasterCard card. AAA members can get even more. Better values, Best Western. For details, visit bestwestern.com. Yes, your love. What do you think? Hey, why don't we use our points from Chase Sapphire and take a break? We can't. Sure we can. The points don't expire. There is nothing There's no travel restrictions. We could leave tomorrow. We can't use them for a vacation. But you can use the points for just about anything. I know. Chase what matters. Get your new Chase Sapphire card at chase.com slash sapphire. Excuse me? I think you're the father of one of my kids. <laughs> oh. Cancun. Spring Break 99. What? No. No. Oh. Oops! Someone forgot to boost! <laughs> Excuse me? I think you're the father of one of my kids. Oh, my daughter's in your art class. Sister Mary Catherine. Yes. Minute Maid enhanced with a five nutrient boost. Put good in, get good out. Someday, the driver will get to choose how efficient or powerful their car will be. The first ever HS Hybrid, only from Lexus. The most fuel efficient of all luxury vehicles. Caught the travel bug? Enter the Travel Bug Treatment Center at IHaveTheBug.com. Are you a voyager like Samantha Brown or a thrill seeker like Anthony Bourdain? Either way, find the perfect prescription to satisfy your travel bug urge at IHaveTheBug.com. An amazing week in exciting Washington, D.C. Plus, a chance to learn the art of digital filmmaking. It could all be yours when you go to win.travelchannel.com and enter our Travel Bug Sweepstakes. You'll go sightseeing in the nation's capital and spend four days at Travel Channel Academy, learning shooting and editing from the experts, getting the know-how you need to tell your own travel stories. So go online, play our trivia quiz, and you could win at win.travelchannel.com. Metrotons! This, this is the one travel show you won't sleep on. This is my adventure! These guys will do anything to beat their travel bug into submission. It's time to take a dump or get off the pot. <laughs> Museums and fancy restaurants. We'll do it as backwards as usual. Throw caution to the wind. Everything is possible and we want to witness it. And dive, dive into Matt Ventures. Now our journey can truly begin. Here we go. Matt Ventures premieres Monday at 10. Whoa! Only on the Travel Channel. Gotcha. People love collecting stuff. Sometimes it's as small and as simple as souvenir buttons. 
And sometimes, well, the collection is bigger. If there's a Pacific car that I see that I've been looking for and I have to have that car, we will spare no dollars on that car. The sound of the engine.